Voices rang out down McKinley Avenue in celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. A candlelight vigil followed by a march to Emmons Auditorium demonstrated how Ball State students, faculty, and friends are living one man's dream. King's daughter, Reverend Bernice King, spoke about her father's influence on her accomplishments. Students expressed their gratitude towards the university for participating in King's memory. Ball State continues the celebration of King's life with Remembering Our Heroes, a candlelight vigil in La Follette Field following the basketball game. Thursday night at 6.30, students can also participate in a campus discussion on race relations at BSU in Cardinal Hall of the Student Center. John and Melissa, back to you. Thanks, Nicole. Along with the march and Reverend, Bernice, Reverend Bernice King's speech, the telecommunications department had a special panel discussion in order to celebrate this diversity. That's right, and News Center reporter Jason Luzak has more at the news desk. In the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr., the telecommunications department at Ball State held a panel discussion with some successful African Americans from the community. The hour-long discussion was held in the Ball Communications Building. Randy Moore, CEO of Indiana Water Company, touched on the effects Martin Luther King Jr. has had with his success. Martin Luther King was a, a forerunner for, for everything, uh, media, uh, the industries that we work in, for uh, minorities to, to get an opportunity. Uh, he was more, in my opinion, he was a key that was stuck in a door that was turned, but we still today have to take the initiative to open the door. Producer and director for WIPB and Janine Lee Lake, a writer for the Star Press, also participated in the discussion panel. Success is something that all of the speakers have in common. They shared some stories to help all students, not just those in the minority, to ensure success in the workplace. Sam Clemens explained that to students that the basics are the key to success. To suggest to them that they expand their writing capabilities, their reading. Uh, studying in uh, areas other than the media uh, in order for them to uh, be ready to deal with the, the world. Students benefited from the insightful discussion. This was a great way for students to understand the struggle African Americans have made in the workplace. John and Melissa? Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. In tomorrow's Ball State Daily News, you can read more about tonight's celebration, as well as a detailed calendar of this week's events. Also from our partners at the Daily News, a legislator changes O'Bannon cigarette tax proposal, and an Indiana U.S. representative challenges the Department of Education concerning the financial aid law. Find out how, how us as students could be affected. Read up on these stories and more in tomorrow's Ball State Daily News. A state appeals court voted unanimously today to uphold a Muncie man's voluntary manslaughter conviction. 24-year-old William Balfour Jr. wanted his conviction overturned because of what he calls insufficient trial evidence. Balfour was charged in 1999 with murdering his girlfriend. A jury found him guilty of voluntary manslaughter and he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. With his conviction upheld, Balfour is still scheduled to be released from prison in May 2014. Subscribers to Comcast cable internet service might experience service disruptions this week. According to Muncie Star Press, Comcast will switch Delaware County customers from the bankrupt Excite at Home network to Comcast high-speed internet early Thursday morning. Subscriptions using static internet pro protocol network addresses will no longer work. Many users are concerned about the changeover. The Star Press added that transitions have not gone well in the Detroit and New Jersey area, leaving users with slow or inaccessible networks. Well, what has gone well, it's been warmer for, warmer for me this week. It was I, I don't enjoy beautiful the cold today. Yeah. Beautiful. It was a beautiful day today, and it's going to be a beautiful night tonight. Oh, we see mostly cloudy skies. The temperature will get down about 41 degrees. All right, thanks, Nick. The store that proudly flashes the blue light special is now waving a white flag. A giant in the retail world, Kmart, is going bankrupt. The company filed for a Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection this morning. The move was widely expected. Kmart CEO Charles C. Conaway agrees that the upset will give the company time to restructure. All of the 2,000-plus Kmart stores will stay open. Executives say they're hoping the company will be back on its feet by early next year. 
Two northern Indiana men are safe today after more than 30 rescuers worked to free them from a collapsed well. It all happened Monday in Hammond. That's where Fort Wayne TV station WPTA says brothers Wayne and Thomas Miley were trapped for more than 11 hours. Reports say Thomas jumped in to help his brother who was completely buried. Officials say Thomas became trapped in sand up to his chest. Wayne Miley is listed in serious condition. The funeral for a Gary servicewoman killed in Pakistan will be held in her hometown on Friday. The remains of Marine Sergeant Jeanette Winters were returned to her family today. Winters died this month when a tanker plane used to refuel aircraft crashed into a mountain into southwestern Pakistan. She was the first servicewoman killed since the U.S.-led Afghan bombing began in October. Indiana Congressman Mike Pence has moved back into his Washington, D.C. office at Longworth House Office Building. It was closed after trace amounts of anthrax were found in Pence's office and the offices of two other congressmen on October 28th. And on Capitol Hill today, con congressional staffers are back at their desks in the Hart Senate Office Building for the first time since mid-October. Officials wanted to be assured the building is anthrax-free. Senate Majority Leader Tom Dasha was among the first to arrive. I know I speak for the entire Senate family in saying that it's good to be back. There has been very frustrating and trying months over the last, uh, the last uh, period of time, but I must say that we have always felt that it was important to put safety over convenience. The reopening was delayed when a bag of protective clothing was found outside Dashiell's office. Officials say anthrax cleanups at congressional buildings have cost about $14 million. And still ahead at News Center at 930, the largest bankruptcy case in history continues in court. We're there with the latest. And it's official. After weeks of wondering, find out who will take over the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts next year. Later in sports, we'll be right back. Attorneys for Enron investors went before a federal judge in Houston today. They're asking the court to take possession of all documents related to the Enron investigation. Over the past two weeks, there have been reports of documents being shredded by the company's former auditor and at Enron as recently as last week. Former Director of International Investment Maureen Castaneda says she used some shredded documents as packing material at home. She says she feels sad for the long-term Enron investors who believed in the company. Enron insists... Um, Enron insists it told its employees not to shred anything important. At least 600 supporters of the militant Hamas group stormed the gate of the main prison in Nablus today. The crowd threw stones and empty bottles at police demanding the release of 25 militants being held at a cr crackdown against Palestinian Authority. One person was shot and wounded and three others were injured by stones. The confrontation erupted hours after four Palestinians were killed by Israeli troops in a raid on Nablus. And the United States is deeply entrenched in the new war against terrorism. The nation's mayors have become the first line of defense. 300 mayors are in Washington tonight for their annual winter meeting. Their number one topic is homeland security. Wolf Blitzer takes a look at how prepared cities are against the threat of terrorism. Replaced by thoughts of fear and vulnerability. Everyone in cities big and small was suddenly faced with the same question. How prepared is our city? How safe is our water supply? Our power plants? The food we eat? Our monuments? Our bridges and buildings? The attacks on New York and Washington forced local officials around the country to reevaluate their emergency response, communications, and transportation systems. Experts say most cities are better prepared now. I think every single day since September 11th, we've made ourselves uh, safer, uh, stronger, and more secure. We still have a lot of work left to do, Wolf, uh, but we're making progress every day. Still, no city is fully prepared to handle a potentially devastating event such as a biological or chemical weapons attack. Wolf Blitzer, CNN, Washington. The movie Black Hawk Down was number one at the box office over the weekend. It's about the U.S. military operation in Somalia in which 18 U.S. troops were killed back in 1993. The movie was shown for the first time today in Somalia. CNN's Jeff Coinage was there. 
By 7 o'clock at night, virtually everyone in Mogadishu had heard Black Hawk Down, the movie, was here. The first bootleg copy to reach Somalia. The price of a ticket, 10 U.S. cents. Hundreds of Somalis crowded into this outdoor playground less than a mile from where the real Black Hawk went down. In this country, where the U.S.'s military effort to catch the powerful Somali warlord Muhammad Aidid was opposed, the audience took delight in scenes of American defeat. Each time an American chopper goes down, the audience cheers. Each time an American serviceman is killed, the audience cheers some more. The Hollywood production relives the events of October 1993, when U.S. forces in Somalia suffered their largest one-day casualties since the Vietnam War. Their mission? To capture ID from his stronghold in the war-torn capital and take him to a ship anchored off the coast nearby. By the time the battle was over 16 hours later, 18 elite American rangers and hundreds of Somalis lay dead in the streets of Mogadishu. Ahmed Abdullah says he witnessed the actual battle and says the movie is more fiction than fact. It's not fair what the U.S. is trying to do. What I saw that day was different from what I see in this film today. It's not accurate, he says. Others say the movie brings back disturbing memories of a day they'll never forget. I felt very sad watching the film, says this woman. It's not right what the Americans are trying to do. Some in this audience were actually proud of the way Somalis were portrayed in Black Hawk Down. They believe they were defending their country and their pride against what they considered U.S. military aggression. As you can see, says this man, Somalis are brave fighters. If the Americans come back to fight us, we shall defeat them again. Let them try again, this man says. They'll be making more films about us when we defeat them like we did that day. The events of that day led to the eventual withdrawal of U.S. forces from Somalia, ending their mission here. Eight years later, Somalia continues to slide into the abyss as anarchy and lawlessness combine to make it one of the most ungovernable places in the world today. While Black Hawk Down may prove entertaining to movie audiences worldwide, Somalis here see it as a painful reenactment of their past. A past that could come back to haunt them, coming at a time when they're looking to the outside world for a helping hand. Jeff Koinange, CNN, Mogadishu. All right, that like, sounds like it'll be a controversial movie. I'm interested to see that. Right, I've, I know a few people that have seen it, but it's good to see they're looking towards the future and looking outside for some support nowadays. And, you know, we're looking outside now to a little bit of weather. It's winter time, but it's not as cold as it should be. That's right, very good, John. Well, let me tell you, if you liked the day outside today, you're definitely going to like what tomorrow has to bring. Find out what's coming along tomorrow coming up in your full forecast. Good evening, everybody. Let's open up the Weather Almanac for today, Tuesday, January 22nd, 2002. Look at that. Can you believe it? Today's high was 52 degrees. That's the average high for Muncie for March 25th, so way above our normal of 32. Our low today was 32 degrees, right in match with our normal high. The sun rose at 758 and set tonight at 548. Our highs today across the state of Indiana, very warm. 54 up in South Bend, 55 was the warmest in Fort Wayne, and 52 down in Evansville. Currently outside, we have fair skies, a temperature of 47 degrees, humidity is at 39 percent. Very comfortable out there. In our satellite picture, we're looking at two things tonight. First, this cold front right here that will be moving into the area, bringing with it some cooler air, but not too much cooler. And also this front right here, which has dropped some storms in the area tonight. Let's look underneath that picture at the radar. Over here you see uh, some storms, and some snow showers uh, on the west coast. Uh, they're dropping some heavy snow over the Cascades tonight. And right here you see storms that move through the Mississippi Valley up into Tennessee and parts of Indiana tonight. And in our local radar picture, you can see uh, those storms moving through down, just clipping Evansville and moving on through. We only saw some scattered precipitation here in Muncie. For tonight, this system moves on through, and here comes that colder air moving on down. And our lows for tonight, very nice. 40s here in Muncie, we'll take that. And for tonight, mostly cloudy skies, a low of 41 degrees, winds south at 15 miles per hour. For tomorrow morning,
the warmth continues. Cloudy skies, a temperature of 45 degrees. And for tomorrow, uh, not too much going on. Uh, the scattered showers we might see tonight move through the area, uh, leaving us with clear skies and a very nice day. For tomorrow, our highs will be in the 50s, higher than we saw today, if you can believe it. And for tomorrow, clearing skies, a high of 56 degrees. Winds out of the southwest at 10 miles per hour. And in our three-day outlook, uh, temperatures in the 40s continue. 43 Thursday, possibly some showers. 42 Friday. Saturday, we go back up to 46 degrees. Unbelievable for this time of year. I'm so excited about this warm weather. I hope it sticks around for a long time. Oh, so do I, Melissa. So <laughs> do I. I enjoyed the snow when it came and, and it went. That was nice. I don't enjoy it staying, but... Good news in Indianapolis. We have good news in weather, good news in Indianapolis as well, depending on who you talk to. Well, new coach for the Indianapolis Colts, Tony Dungy. He'll be inter introduced tomorrow. I'll have that and more when New Center 43 returns. The Ball State women's basketball team came into tonight with a 12-4 record this season, 4-1 record in the MAC. Akron, just the opposite of BSU. The Zips came into tonight's, tonight losers of 13 straight. Their last game against Western Michigan, the Zips were up by 13 and a half, and they still lost. So let's go to John E. e. Worthen Arena. We have courtesy of D IPB Sports, and if we can roll those highlights. Look, big arena, remember, February 2nd, so we're going to try to break the attendance record. Come to the game, it's 6,000. As you can see, not many people there. Early on, Julie Just to Amy Fuller. She hits the easy two, she gets fouled, she'd go to the line, hit another two. Then it's Fuller again, off the inbound pass, a sweet turnaround, hits a two again. Ball State up big in the second, up by 30. Then Tamara Bowie, that's just not fair, hits the fadeaway right in the girl's face. Ball State up 35 at that point. Then it's Fuller again. Fuller drives the lane, hits the two. Can you believe it? Ball State wins 99 to 55. Tamara Bowie has 24 points on 12 of 14 from the field. Amy Fuller had a double-double, 12 points, 10 rebounds. Akron committed 30 turnovers. The biggest number, Ball State scored 60 points in the paint to Akron's 20. They outscored him in the paint. Altogether, the men's basketball team takes on Western Michigan tomorrow night. Ball State's been on a roll over late. Over the late. They've won their last five in the conference. They're in first place in the West Division all by themselves, and they, had, they have a two-game lead. The only downside to this is the Cardinals are still coming out and starting games really slow. Rumors are head coach Tim Buckley's going to make some changes for tomorrow night's game. The Cardinals' starting lineup is, has not been changed this year. Chris Williams, Petey Jackson, T. Smith, Lonnie Jones have all started. But tomorrow night, Williams could be on the bench. Some good news for the Cardinals. Senior guard Patrick Jackins, Bat Jackson set the career mark for three-pointers BSU. for BSU. He was named Comac Player of the Week. Tip-off is set for 7 o'clock at Worthen Arena tomorrow night. The search for a new head coach for the Indianapolis Colts is over. ESPN is reporting former head, Tampa Bay head coach Tony Dun Dungy has agreed to, in principle, with the Colts on a five-year deal worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $12 million. Dungy was fired just eight days ago Tampa Bay, or by Tampa Bay, even though they did make the playoffs. Dungy had reportedly been offered the Carolina Panthers coaching position, but for $5 million less. A formal announcement of Dungy's hiring is expected sometime tomorrow. You know, I remember back in the days of Little League and the movie The Bad News Bears, the popular saying, let them play. Well, the Minnesota Circuit Court did just that, saying the Minnesota Twins have to play next season in the Metrodrome and cannot be contracted. The lawyers for Major League Baseball and the Twins' ownership will appeal the ruling to the Minnesota Supreme Court, but the way things are going, it is very unlikely that the Twins or the Montreal Expos will be contracted as the start of spring training is less than a month away. A news conference to promote a title boxing match became a boxing match today as Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis ended up fighting instead of talking about their April 6th fight in Las Vegas. It all started when Tyson approached Lewis. As Lewis came on stage, one of Lewis's bodyguards punched, pushed Tyson, 
Tyson threw a punch and then Lewis did the same. All of it happened in a matter of minutes. After order was restored, Tyson released a, state, a written statement which said he went up to Lewis as part of an agreement standoff by both camps and Lewis's bodyguard is the one at fault. Interesting. We'll see what happens. He doesn't even have his license to fight in Nevada, which is where the fight is supposed to take place. So we'll see. Looks like a good production meeting here at New Center. Uh, well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to believe that um, we're still in winter season with all this warm, warm weather. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nicholas Ferrari will be back with a look at your forecast when we get back. Stay, Stay tuned. tuned. Look at our weather for tonight. We'll see mostly cloudy skies, a low of 41 degrees. For tomorrow, we will see mostly cloudy skies, clearing later on. Uh, in the morning, 45 degrees, very pleasant morning. Tomorrow, the skies will clear as the day goes on, high of 56 degrees. Winds will be southwest at 10 miles per hour. And in the three-day outlook, temperatures in the 40s continue. Some showers possible on Thursday. Uh, Friday 42, Saturday 46. Nice week ahead. You can wear your light coats if you're brave enough. All right, All right, thanks, Nicholas. Pool party at my house. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us for News Center 930. I'm John Ratliff. And I'm Melissa Cordial. News Center 43 is an official CNN Student Bureau. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for News Center at 530.